So the next drug that has been recently FDA approved is Voxelator. And I want to start with um, uh, Dr. Shah or Nirmish. What is Voxelator? Talk about the HOPE study that got it approved by the FDA. How does it work? What does it do? Yeah, so, so this is a, a drug that's a hemoglobin modifier. So it actually uh, binds to the hemoglobin, actually to the, the alpha globin, and it increases the oxygen affinity. And again, speaking to what we were talking about in regards to hydroxyurea, in a very similar fashion, if you have uh, hemoglobin that's holding onto oxygen, you're, you're preventing that sickling uh, uh, polymerization that you have. And, and so it's a, it's a very interesting drug in the sense that it is uh, taken up directly by the red blood cells. It doesn't have to go and trick the, bo the bone marrow into making more fetal hemoglobin. Uh, so it has this kind of pan-cellular effect. It has this effect across uh, all the hemoglobins within the red blood cell. Um, and, and so the, the interesting part of what this product is trying to do is focus on preventing sickling and increasing the hemoglobin. And, and so the, the trial uh, was a, again, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial looking at two different doses, 1,500 milligrams, 900 milligrams, uh, and placebo, and trying to compare that their primary outcome, did it increase the hemoglobin by one mm -hmm. uh, in those patients that were treated. Okay. And um, Bray, so with the study, what was the toxicity profile like for the patients who were participating in it? So what, what should we expect to see when we start prescribing this medicine for sickle cell disease? I think it was generally well tolerated. Um, I think common um, complications or adverse events included a uh, headache, uh, maybe 10% rash, which is a little bit surprising, but generally well tolerated. Um, so it's, and it's oral, which okay. is That's different from crizolizumab. I think we didn't IV touch on that. Crizolizumab yeah. is mm -hmm. IV, uh, Voxelator is an oral drug. Mm -hmm. And the, the dose approved was the 1,500 milligrams or the 900 milligrams? 1,500 milligrams. milligrams. And so what are the clinical implications? So who would be the ideal patient to offer this drug to? So I you think know, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> yeah, I, one thing we, we forgot to mention or did mention up front is that what we saw was a, a, an increase in hemoglobin, right, by, by at least a gram, which was their primary endpoint. But we, it, we didn't see any other changes. So we didn't see any significant reductions in pain or vasoocclusive crises. And so I think that that's what makes this a little bit harder in sort of determining you know, optimal treatments right. for optimal people. But certainly, right, I, I would think we all probably agree that we have some individuals who cannot be transfused for mm -hmm. various reasons. And have very low antibodies, yeah. low hemoglobin. People with kidney disease, low EPO, who have very low hemoglobin. So yeah, I think there's def there are definitely there are definitely populations for which a rise in, in the hemoglobin would be beneficial. But I think getting back to what Nirmish was saying about the mechanisms of action, it's just not simply raising the hemoglobin, but decreasing hemolysis, which we know leads to a lot of of complications in sickle cell disease, including Can pulmonary hypertension. Can you speak about that a little bit? Because I think a lot of providers are unaware that in sickle cell disease, you no, don't just only have vasoocclusion, which is one very well-known pathophysiology mechanism, but also the hemolysis has its own separate set of short and long-term consequences. So kind of talk about that a little bit. Right, so I think we've begun to understand maybe decade, decade and a half ago, more and more the impact of hemolysis and release of free hemoglobin, which scavenges nitric oxide and causes a relative depletion of nitric oxide, which further enhances vasoconstriction. Um, and, and so, it, the, the hemolytic effects of having sickle cell disease are profound and do contribute to vasculopathy. Um, so we're understanding that. And I think that for people to better understand Voxelator, where it plays a role is not just in raising the hemoglobin, which we know just for simple transfusion, getting a patient's hemoglobin up by one gram doesn't really do much. Um, but if you're decreasing hemolysis, uh, I think that, that that's that's really where you get the clinical benefits. I think going back to that that number, the mat, you know, this magic number of one, you know, that's been the debate, and so I, I think that many times now we're referencing uh, Kenataga's talk from last ash, mm -hmm. where you had the meta analysis looking at you know what are subgroups of patients that have other you know complications. So you have pulmonary hypertension, you have uh, acute chest, uh, you have more mortality, and the difference in hemoglobin again, this in a retrospective fashion. Uh, showed that the difference was between 0.4 and 1.1. So really, very small amount of hemoglobin did make a difference. So I think but, it... But it did, but it didn't prove that changing that hemoglobin yeah. would change so, that outcome. So literally answer my next <laughs> sentence there, which is Patience, that yeah, the, next <laughs> sen you know, the next uh, thought process is, well, give me time to say that can I prospectively make that difference? And, and so, you know, the data so far has not clearly shown any clinical benefit. You know, there are some separations of the curve for pain, so maybe down the Over line we, we may have some uh, more data to show that. 
Um, but, but pathophysiologically, as you're saying, the two main buckets, the two main issues within sickle cell disease BOCR are hyperhemolysis and anemia and, and then basal occlusion. So now we have two drugs that, that really address both. But they can overlap. Absolutely. Absolutely. But they can overlap, yeah. yeah.